The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hi, I'm Dom Bentinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel is Patrick Mason. Hey, Patrick. Howdy, Dom. Uh, Folks, before we get into today's show, I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we talk about that uh, amazing BBC uh, uh, TV show that's been on for... Oh, I don't know, since about the Middle Ages or something, but... Uh, Ever. <laughs> just, the, it's, it's been on forever. <laughs> and, and, we'll, and we'll always be on, and so we'll always have a podcast about it. Uh, so you can check that out wherever fine podcasts are found, or at sqpn.com slash Doctor Who. Now, I wasn't on... We didn't have an episode last week. Uh, I wasn't on, because we we, I, we can't have an episode if I'm not on. That's just the way it works. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was he, I was actually away. I, I was going away to do a college visit with my daughter to my alma mater, Franciscan University of Steubenville, Ohio. I'm no one can see it's like Patrick, but I'm wearing a T-shirt that I picked up because, you know, it's one of those things alumni do when we go back to our, our alma maters. Yep. Um, one of the great things about going was just seeing how high tech everything is now for students. It's like how different in ways like so much more happens via app and like you know because i went to school in the dark ages 30 (laughs) years ago uh, i was i was one of the very first students to have a laptop in a classroom taking notes Uh, Mm. it was me and a couple other guys uh bill oh what is bill sorry bill if you're listening to this i'm very sorry i don't remember your last name off the top of my head but it was bill and i and um Oh, also, um, Jeff Cavins was was one of my classmates. So, oh. and uh, Jeff gave me a copy of the Catechism as a Word doc uh, at the time. All very high tech, which is to contrast it to just today, which is it just it's everything is so high tech now. Students are every student's on a laptop everywhere, working. You know, everything's QR codes, and the the uh, e- even the pub um, at the student center where uh, it's not just a pub, but, you know, it's like pub food. They have like a DoorDash sort of thing where you can order via an app. And, you know, it's just, huh. it's just That's neat. college life is so much cooler now. Um, <laughs> I, I, I texted my wife and said, can I re-enroll? She said no. So yeah, It's probably wise. <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I went back to college. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, plus they have so many cool classes and they had... Um, new buildings and stuff so it's i've i've been back i went I, I went there five years ago but even since five years ago i uh it's been it's so much better yeah oh yeah i uh you know i went to texas a&m uh university and at their college station campus and that's about 20 years ago now and going back I it's main even the main campus is barely recognizable. They built so many buildings and torn old ones down and rebuilt them. Like the old engineering building is now a whole new building uh, complex. They the old parking lot that that was in has a new building in it, and then they've built like three more extra campuses just around town. <laughs> that, yeah, it's it seems to be the thing. That's what colleges do. They build buildings. They tear old buildings down and build new ones. Yep. Because deep pocketed alumni have got to do something with all that cash. Yeah. So how about making the tuition free? But that's a whole nother. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Oh, my gosh. So, so uh, that's, sometimes. that's yeah. not our uh, main topic tonight. Our, the main thing we're here to talk about is actually slightly college related, which is we're going to be talking about live streaming sports. So uh, it has got to the point now where um just a few years ago, the only thing I used cable TV for was to watch local news and sports. And in 2024, I don't even do that anymore uh, because I can stream the local news from their apps and you can pretty much stream just about any sport. You don't need c- cable TV with an asterisk. I want to put an asterisk on it because yeah. the access to certain uh, channels 
still requires you to enter your cable TV credentials to get to them. So that so that we'll, we'll cover so, uh, a lot of that. But we want to talk about a bunch of a bunch of different sports that you can stream and and how you get to them and 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 those things. And I want to start with the big daddy of all the big sports out there, the big money maker, which is NFL. Um, you know, no matter what sport you like, you have to admit NFL is the big the big guy on the block. Uh, yeah. And there's a whole oh, yeah. bunch of places where NFL is, and it's kind of hard to keep track in some ways of where where the games are streaming. But I think it kind of breaks down like this. You can correct me if I'm wrong. So you have the NFC and the AFC. Those are the two big divisions within the NFL. Mm-hmm. And the and the NFC games are generally on Fox Sports, you know, Fox Network. And then you can stream them at foxsports.com. But this is one of those ones where you have to have your, uh, I don't think they have a separate subscription. I think you still have to have a cable subscription to stream a game via Fox Sports. So, uh, yeah, that's that's my understanding. Or one of the cable like streaming services like uh, Fubo or Sling that yes. emulates it that the major network has uh, a license with. So, for instance, on Sling, you can watch Fox, but you can't watch CBS. Right. Um, and that's just that's one of those licensing things. <laughs> and that's right. that's like really what dominates all of the craziness with trying to figure out what you can watch, where you can watch it. We've we've talked uh, about this in our cord cutting episodes. We're talking about getting rid of cable. And there are a couple of websites. I'll have to dig them out of the those episodes uh, where you can go and compare you know, like Fubo, Sling, YouTube TV, all of the different uh, cable cutting uh, substitutes, you know, web, you know, uh, web services, um, and compare their lineups and see what you can get from which ones. And so that you're getting the stuff that covers what you want to see. That's the big issue is you want to make sure you're getting the stuff that you want to see. So yeah. as it, so I said, the Fo- NFC games are generally on Fox, AFC games, a year on CBS, which means that they're on Paramount plus. And for that, if you have a Paramount Plus subscription, uh, which uh, you know you may, if you're a Star Trek fan or something like that, you can you can watch the games streaming there, uh, which is what I do. And because I have an Apple TV, I can watch it on my big screen. And that's actually another another aspect of all this is where you can watch it on a phone, on a tablet, on a big screen. Yeah. And so uh, that's where I watch that. And I, I will say, there's one caveat. Uh, to the Sunday games, NFC, AFC break, and that's the Sunday night football, which yep. is its own special license, and NBC has that, and so those are on NBC and Peacock. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and that could be quickly. AFC, that could be yeah. NFC, you never yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, you could, you see how quickly, if you want to catch all the games, how that can add up. Yeah. Uh, and then there's, and, a, there's two more. Because this Monday Night Football, which is ABC or ESPN, it used to be ABC. It's ESPN. Yeah. What's the so Disney that's on, bundle? <laughs> yeah, Disney, Hulu, ESPN, you know, th- that whole thing. ABC, yeah. Um, and then Thursday Night Football, that's on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Um, so do you have, originally and, you didn't have to be a Prime subscriber to watch on Amazon Prime. I don't that a few years ago when they started. I don't know if they've. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a Prime subscriber, so I, I, I don't yeah. really pay attention. I think you do need to be a Prime subscriber now. Okay. Um, and I will say, there's some weird caveats on that one too, because the very first game of the season is a Thursday night football game. But I want to say NBC owns the license rights to the first football game of the season, so that is not on Amazon Prime. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can blame the NFL and it's and it's you know grasping yeah. a do- every possible dollar for, and, for this mess. Yeah, the other uh, wrench to throw into it is those uh, games have uh, are regionalized. So if you were to watch them on cable or on your local, like if you have an antenna, I still have an antenna um, that I use pretty regularly, and. If you are to watch those games, you only get certain games in certain time slots, depending on where you are regionally, you know, they'll try and get your mm-hmm. local team. Well, some of the services will look at your IP address 
and decide you're in this region and they will black out the games from the from the regions you're not supposed to see because that's the way the license is written from the NFL. Right. And because sometimes, you know, if you have a VPN or other, you know, funkiness with your connection to the Internet, they may think that you're not where you are, really are. And yep. and sometimes that may work in your in your behalf. Like if you really want to be watching a game that's in a different place that your IP address says you are, that's great. But if you're trying to watch your local you know, sports team and they say, well, you're not there. And you say, yes, I am. <laughs> I don't know why you don't think I am. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. So that it gets tr- pretty tricky there. Yeah. Um, and then there's a, there's a whole nother thing, which is possible, which is the NFL itself operates the NFL network in a service called NFL plus. And uh, that gives you access to the games, but only on phone or tablet. So, <laughs> so uh, that that th- th- you can't stream it on your TV, uh, on or on a, a desktop computer. I assume uh, yeah. it can only be via an app, not app. a web so, website. I, I wonder if you could do it on the Apple TV though, because it's essentially the same app. Uh, you might curious. be able to do it. It's and that's this is a change uh, from last year, I think, because the. Basically, the only way to watch absolutely everything is the NFL, and with a single single thing is NFL Plus. Yeah, and that used to be true for the YouTube TV, uh, but they have changed the YouTube TV portion to just be Sunday Ticket, so you can watch every Sunday game, and that's the way you defeat the whole blackout thing. Right, is by getting that, but you still don't get Thursday and Monday. Um, right. or the occasional Friday game. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so, like, that's the NFL Plus is the only way to do it. But like you said, there's there's um, restrictions on how you can access that. Right. Um, yeah, you can get. I, yeah. I, I use some sort of casting technology to send it to your TV if, if you can do that. Right. Right. Um, and it's not like super expensive. It's like seven bucks a month for the basic NFL Plus. Um, if if you add in Red Zone, which is when they edit down the games to just like the big plays and the scores. I forget exactly how it works, but it basically takes the game from being two and three quarter hours to about, you know, half an hour to 40, 40 minutes or something like that. Well, red zone, what red zone does, and it's very good for people with limited attention spans um, is it, (laughs) it moves from game to game. So throughout the first two blocks of playtime. So the NFL has basically three blocks of games. If you count Sunday night and Sunday night, there's a single game. There's typically only a couple games in the four o'clock, four thirty time frame. This is Eastern time. And yep. then the one thirty time frame or the one o'clock time frame, you've got typically six games going on, possibly eight, depending on what they've decided to do. And um, what red zone does is it says who's closest to scoring a, you know, who's closest to scoring a, a goal and we switch to them <laughs> and oh, then, when they're in the red zone, which is the 20 yards leading up to the goal line. Correct. So whoever's closest to scoring a touchdown, that's what you're watching. Yep. Uh, okay. And then you switch to the next one. Uh, oh, I said goal, didn't I? Yeah, I'm at touchdown. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like such a noob. <laughs> I'm really a football fan. Uh, so that may be. I don't know if it's the most complicated set of restrictions and deals because the college sports, you know, especially college football, is also kind of all over the place too. I think. Yeah, um, it's fairly complex. I tried to look at it, and it looks like really, if you want to watch college, like there are several cable channels dedicated to college sports, and those are all mostly on things like Hulu plus YouTube TV, Fubo sling and that sort of thing. Um, there are some college games available through your Paramount plus your Fox sports, your Peacock. There's a, there's like a handful of college sports there. Um, so it's really all over the place. As far as I could tell, is that, is that correct? Or what do you think? Right. So it, it is. And that's because, um, you know, and this is this is my opinion, but the NCAA is a joke. Um, <laughs> it's not good at negotiating with the conferences or between the conferences. 
or on behalf of them. So basically the major conference, the four sports conferences all go out on their own to make their own TV and, and streaming deals. Uh, and this is this has actually been a huge factor for the sport in general the last two years because we saw the breakup of an entire conference, the Pac-12, uh, went down to the Pac-2 uh, over the course of a year because of bad TV mm. deals, basically. And that was a hundred year old conference. I mean, that was that was a big deal. Um, so this th- there's a lot of money. Uh, involved in all this and so what you see is the various conferences get in bed with different tv networks uh so for instance a&m is part of the sec they're in bed with uh disney which is abc uh so i can watch them anything that does all the abc stuff uh es which espn which actually kind of makes it a little easier um so with that with college uh ball what you kind of have to do is, okay, if I want to watch this team, right, whatever my team is, right, whoever that is, then I need to figure out where, what network their conference is, is being, you know, hosted by, because uh, I want to say Big 12 is on Fox, and I want to say Big 10, maybe CBS, or it might be opposite, because last year the SEC was on CBS, so like it, <laughs> it changes every year. Uh, mm-hmm. But figure out who your conference is aligned with, and then that streaming service will have their stuff. Uh, and then if you go in for um, Fubo or Sling, Hulu, YouTube TV, one of those, make sure that they have those conferences' networks, because occasionally they'll have those the games on those individual networks. And that would be like the SEC network, the Big Ten network, uh, the Big 12 network, the ACC networks, and the Pac- Pac-12 used to have like a dozen channels, but it, it doesn't anymore. But um, and th- and that's kind of how you have to do it. It's it's it is somewhat haphazard, and it changes from year to year. Right. Yeah, I'm looking at because uh, Boston College uh, is our you know our our lo- big local football you know college football, yeah. and it looks like they're on. Well, uh, the CW for some games. Yes, that and that's new this year. <laughs> that's, Goodness. Uh, and then ABC, ESPN for others. Yeah. Um, so, th- so it's basically you gotta just you just gotta hunt for it, really. Mm-hmm. So, um, and and um, what I ended up doing was I I went with Sling because they had a couple packages that just scatter shot like everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically the only thing I was missing was sling with CBS. And, um, for me, it, it didn't matter cause I had everything I needed through, uh, the SEC plus stuff. So I was good. Right. Um, and that, that's a good way if you're, and I'm, I, if, as far as football is concerned, I'm not just a fan of the single teams. I mean, I am, but I enjoy the sport as a whole. And so I will watch games that have no bearing <laughs> on, right. on my team or the conference I'm in at all. So having that kind of flexibility is is nice for me. If if you're just a fan of a single team and you're only interested in watching their games, you can be a little more targeted. Okay. All right. So let's move on to something that's a little more a little more straightforward, uh, which is Major League Baseball, which is as we're recording in the midst of uh, the playoffs heading up to the World Series. So they just stream their own stuff. You know, they do all their own streaming. It's MLB.tv. You subscribe to the season and postseason separately. Um, so when you subscribe to the season, you're generally subscribing um, subject to certain blackouts. So one of the things with, with TV rights for most professional sports is if the, if the, if the game isn't sold out, then they don't air the show, the, the game uh, on air locally. It's designed to encourage people, you know, it's a deal they made decades ago with the team owners so that people will not just stay at home and watch from the comfort of their home, but will actually go to the park and buy a ticket and a hot dog and a drink and whatever and uh, sit in the stands and watch games. Um, I don't, I mean, unless you're the, what was it, who was it this year? Chicago White Sox? Uh, Yeah. I think people are going out to the ballpark, (laughs) but. Um, I mean, the White Sox only won like 20, 23, 27 yeah. games. It was like a historic of, uh, number of lost games. Yeah, it's uh, it, yeah. 
<laughs> I feel very badly for everybody <laughs> yeah. in that organization. <laughs> if you are if you are a White Sox fan or a member of the White Sox, I, I'm I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. Yeah. Um. There's always next year. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh. But so they, it's pretty reasonably priced. It's six bucks a month. Um. For yeah, for the uh, MLB TV for this this regular season, the postseason package is thirty bucks. But you get all the games. You, you get to watch everything in that for that thirty bucks, which is pretty good. And from I don't I personally don't subscribe to it, but from those I know who are baseball aficionados, they say that MLB their their streaming package is like the way that they do everything has always been top notch. It's been it's been always been a really good experience. They have really good features really good extras that make the uh, streaming experience better than just watching it on TV, you know, regular local cable uh, or, or whatnot. So um, that's been really good. Uh, but there, there are, it looks like in our notes, Patrick, you have um, a caveat on that. Right. So like you mentioned about the blackout thing, it, the problem is most regular season games do not sell out. You can almost guarantee on that one. Occasionally, you'll find the big rivalry games, like whenever the Rangers play the Astros, those games are sold out. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Um, or the, Ye the Yankees. Yeah. Anytime the Yankees come to any town, pretty much it sells out just because the Yankees are the, you know, they're the Cowboys of the of the MLB. They're the everybody. <laughs> and you the can ones find, everybody loves to hate. Yeah, that's right. Out there, the Alabama, <laughs> if you want to college football. Um, so, but very, so a lot of times, you will have that blackout in effect. And if you're local, it's going to do the same thing to you with your IP address and say, oh, sorry, I can't serve it to you because you're local. And local can be a long way out. I live about an hour drive from the stadium in Arlington where the, uh, the ballpark. And I know because I was a season ticket holder this year. Uh, because, you know, the Rangers won the World Series. I figured <laughs> I'd, I'd do them a favor, buy a season ticket. Um, so I, I went to like 60 games this year, had a lot of fun, but it's an hour, uh, and I'm still in the blackout zone, right? So if I want to watch the Rangers play, I've got to go find a service that works for them. Well, this is another case of every team made a deal with their own people. So Major League Baseball, because they have MLB TV, uh, is like, yeah, you do what you want for this. And so if I want to do the Rangers, I think there's one streaming service for them. There's another for everybody has their own streaming services. And some of them don't even have that. Um, there's a couple ball clubs that are just it's the local TV affiliate. And um, if that TV affiliate has a streaming service, then you can watch it. But otherwise, right. good luck. <laughs> yes. For example, the so in here in New England we have in Essen, New England Sports Network, where they air the Bruins and on the in the uh, NHL and the Red Sox and the uh, MLB, and uh, so you can get streaming Nesson for uh, a bucket. They they say a dollar a day. It's thirty bucks uh, a month, um, or <laughs> um, one hundred and eighty dollars for the year. That ain't cheap, folks. No. Um, and then it renews. Oh, my gosh. It renews at 330 bucks a year uh, after the first year. Now, the good thing is, is they don't play every month of the year. So you could get a monthly plan. If you just want to watch Red Sox games, you get a monthly plan and you watch from, you know, April to, uh, well, if you're lucky, October. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh but if you're like a Red Sox and Bruins fan, that's well, that covers your whole year. So you're paying through the nose for that. Uh, 30 bucks, 30 bucks a month is a lot. Wow. Yeah. I've seen that before. Um, yeah, and that's that's uh, like you, you have to do that for the team, particular team that you're interested in following. That's not every team. Uh, so, you know, you could do the MLB TV. But see, the thing is, as a Sox fan, Fenway is small enough and the Sox are popular enough that they pretty much sell out every game. I don't oh, yeah. think they ever have a blackout. So, so the MLB for us, the MLB TV might be the better deal, right? So if if your if your baseball team is old enough and popular enough, it's very likely that they're like season passed out, which means that their yes. entire stadium has been sold out to season pass holders for you know decades now. <laughs> you know right. the only way you're getting a ticket is through like StubHub or, or one of the resellers, 
And uh, so they're literally guaranteed to be sold out every game, right? Um, for newer ball clubs and newer could be, you know, 50, the Rangers are 50 years old. <laughs> they don't sell out right. every game. <laughs> um, and they have a nice big new stadium. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a 40, 41,000. I want to say yeah. 42,000. It's huge. So Even that's the other the expansions thing. expansions at, at Fenway, that's like more than twice the size. Yeah. Right. Um, so those are things to keep in mind with that. So um, you may, you may be again with MLB, you may have to hunt around a bit to get the one that you can see. Now, what about NBA? Do they, does the NBA have its own NBA.TV? Um, yeah. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> It it's it's a little I think and I don't follow uh, the NBA nearly as closely. I typically am kind of a postseason guy when the NBA comes around, so, and then then mm-hmm. it's easier to get a hold of the stuff. But I I think during regular season, the NBA sort of equivalent to the MLB TV, it doesn't cover every game, um, and that is that is really the problem with watching NBA. Um, is that it's on a lot of different streaming services, but good luck finding your team. <laughs> like, right. You know, in any given like two week span, you know, I, I'm I'm from I live in Dallas. I'm a Dallas sports fan, uh, and I I follow the Mavericks. I might there might be one Mavericks game on air on any given streaming device in a two week time span but they're going to play eight games in that time frame. And so that that's kind of the the problem is trying to figure out what what services you have to have to watch what games you want to watch to watch your team is right. is problematic. Uh you kind of just have to subscribe to like everything. <laughs> right. So they they do have like a subscription service NBA um uh, on NBA.com, like for, t- for NBA TV, it's, it's called uh, Stream Live Game Action from Your Favorite Device with NBA League Pass. So, and they have home and away streams. And uh, so, but that's, and then you pay for the season. So they have, uh, with commercials, it's 110 bucks for the season. Uh, without commercials, ad-free, it's 160 bucks. Uh, you also get to watch it on up to three devices. Um, so uh, so that's not too bad, but they also have a feature where, again, you can log in with your cable TV or Fubo YouTube TV credentials and and get what's available on those channels for you know through the NBA the NBA TV you know on their website. So you're not really getting a huge advantage by doing it, but maybe you're on your phone and you, I don't know, you, you you can't access your Fubo or something. I don't know why you would prefer to do that or not. Um, but in any case, um, so th- there are those options, but uh, what you're saying is even if I subscribe to NBA TV, um, do I not get all of the right. games? You don't get the blackout. Oh. It still yes. blacks out. So just like the Major League Baseball uh, legalistic stuff, <laughs> they black out NBA games. And it's almost actually a little harder uh, blackout rules than Major League yeah. Baseball. It's this just is, like flat out. You can't watch local games. Sorry. Right. It's not whether it's sold out or not. Like it says yeah. right here, based on your current location, you will be unable to view live Celtics games or nationally broadcast games on ESPN, ABC, or TNT. So I'm paying 110 bucks so I can watch a bunch of teams I don't care about, you know, right. if that were the case. Yeah. Like, you have to be someone who loves basketball in general and doesn't want to miss anything. I'm right. not sure who pays this. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then the other thing, the other line in there where it says nationally broadcast games on ESPN, ABC, or TNT, uh, if you don't have, if you have a league pass, you won't get those games either. Um, right. Unless you've entered your subscription to those services into your league pass. I see. I see. Yeah. So, right. so you have, subscription, <laughs> have to have a subscription to those services. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. So basically 
is not really a good solution for NBA. There really isn't. Um, you know, it, at least I would say at least college has the the you know the individual conferences aligned with certain networks, and you can go through those. The NBA doesn't seem to have a real good way to do this, um, and it's just most. Of, I think the NBA website has a way to look at you know your your team and where they're what they're going to be broadcast on. So you can look at that schedule and, and sort of plan accordingly, but you may end up having to subscribe to three to five services by the end of okay. it. And the WNBA is similar, but yeah, it's, if, it's pretty much the same. I mean, it, it yeah. I mean, I think it's some of the same management folks at the top. So a lot of it runs right. exactly the same. Um, and then the yeah. NHL is, um, how, how NHL is probably similar to MLB, where there are also a lot of teams have regional channel sports channels that they're already affiliated with. So, um, when you want to stream, is this probably the same thing? Pretty much. Um, if if you have, so they break it into what's called national games and regional games, and that's really broadcast stuff. So on Nash for national stuff, it's all going to be on the Disney channels. So uh, ABC, ESPN, TNT. So you should be able to get those with ESPN Plus. So anything that's broadcast nationally. Um, for regional stuff, it is team by team. So um, you you kind of got a. It's very similar to Major League Baseball. They don't really necessarily have the same blackout rules <laughs> so that's good but you go find your team you find out what streaming service they use and you you subscribe to that one um again some of them don't use streaming services they use the local tv affiliate and if they don't if they're not associated with the streaming service you're almost out of luck okay uh, and, and that's of uh, course in the u.s yes. <laughs> and if you're in canada the rules are different <laughs> of course <laughs> So, um, in Canada, what, what do you have? Um, a um, service for national games and regionals for the individual, right? Teams? So, but the service for the national games in Canada is either Prime Video or Sportsnet. So they're Amazon not Prime. Yeah. Um, yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So at least it's a you know something people know. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, and then you had soccer or uh, football, as the rest of the world calls it. And although the it's, British it's soccer, Dom. No. <laughs> yeah, the original, let's be clear: the original British name for the sport was soccer. They're the ones who named it soccer. They're the ones who changed. So let's you know, let's keep yeah. let's so keep that uh, that straight here, you, you <laughs> soccer fans. Anyway, uh, now that one I know is uh, if you want to watch Major League, you know, American Major League Soccer. That's Apple TV Plus. Apple has exclusive deal with them. If you have a Apple TV Plus subscription or an Apple One subscription, which is the bundle of all the Apple services, you're you're there. And if you have an Apple Vision Pro, they're actually showing parts of some games in Vision in 3D, like on oh. the field, which I think that would feel stressful. <laughs> the ah, the ball's gonna hit me. Oh wait, no. Yeah. <laughs> um. So so you can watch the MLS. Every game is available on Apple TV, which is great. Uh, but there are there's more than MLS for when it comes to soccer, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I, I will say though, fortunately, the major soccer leagues have all kind of like zeroed in on a single service. And so if, if you have a league that you like, you, the, you can figure out the service real quick. So for uh, for EFL, that's the English uh, football leagues. For the Premier League. They do everything via the NBC family of networks. So if you're going to stream, it's going to be Peacock. Okay. Um, and that's just, that's it. Like, and, and it's it's just so easy. Like, I, just, <laughs> I wish, I wish the, the American sports would get in the, well, other than Major <laughs> League Soccer, because they did it too, right? Apple TV. Um, if you want to watch uh, EFL, and I bring up League One specifically, um, because it's the league that Wrexham plays in now because they got promoted in April. Uh, right. Spoiler, I guess. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you're watching the documentary, but you're not paying to the paying attention to the actual football itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, League One is actually on Paramount Plus, so they're affiliated with the CBS stations. Okay. 
um, and and ESPN Plus um, for some reason, and some of them on Discovery because of the Paramount. I, I don't know. It's it's kind of weird. Um, and then if you want to watch La Liga, which is the uh, Spanish uh, league, that is on ESPN, uh, ESPN Plus. If if you then, ever wander into yeah. ESPN uh, Deportes, uh, <laughs> that channel, that's what you're going to watch. <laughs> like 90% of the coverage of that channel is La Liga uh, okay. <laughs> uh, games. And then just like a few other things, like if you want to watch PGA Tour, that's on um, the, uh, the Paramount Plus. Um, you know, because of the, the, the deals that they already have with CBS, which owns Paramount Plus, so and also like the NCAA March Madness, that's all going to be on Paramount Plus, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah. So the bottom line is, it's all very complicated uh, to yeah. watch sports via streaming, and the hope is is that someday this can be simplified. Uh, you know, whether through a portal or like or like Apple did, where just one one entity bought up the rights to brought to stream everything from that sport. I mean, uh, that, that's, I think it may be the only league that is just on, that is exclusively on one outlet, uh, yeah. uh, Apple TV plus. Yeah. Um, well, so. and, you know, if, if anything, if anything was going to rapidly technologically educate large swaths of the male population of the United States, it's the complexity <laughs> of trying to watch <laughs> sports. <laughs> Uh, via streaming <laughs> right 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 there's always talk every year about like apple snapping up some you know nfl streaming rights or something like that um it would be interesting to see a company like apple come in or even amazon to expand its footprint from thursday to other times uh yeah. to, to really to see how that would go i'd be curious to see how a tech company would handle this as opposed to a broadcast company yeah. Uh, so well, at Bally Sports uh, kind of attempted to do that with Major League Baseball a couple of years ago. And they did it so poorly, it more or less flat, so fell flat on its face. You can yeah. you can still see that there are uh, affiliates of Bally Sports or subdivisions of Bally Sports that still stream some of the, uh, a lot of the uh, individual teams. But as a yeah. they tried to do it kind of as a whole, and it just sort of, it didn't really end up yeah. working. Yeah. There's too much money, too yeah. much money involved in all this. And I, that's probably what keeps it all so messy. Yep. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. All right. Well, I don't know if that helped anyone. <laughs> 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 you can let us know. Um, and if we've missed something, uh, you get, or you get some really good tips on how to get through this morass of, you know, streaming sports. Love to hear you. Is there, is there an obscure sport we missed? that uh, you love to watch streaming. I'd love to hear that too. So uh, I, I will yeah. say it, yeah, there is a, a kind of long winded workaround to some of this in some countries, almost all of the sports, uh, American sports gets bundled together into single services across, you know, it could be baseball and football and, you know, hockey mm -hmm. and, and whatever else. And, um, it's all under one umbrella and you pay one fee. So if you're willing to figure out what Eastern European block country <laughs> <laughs> that you could get your VPN to pretend it's IP is from and then sign up for this service, <laughs> then you might I be able to pull Poland. off. <laughs> I am yes. from Poland and I would like to watch your American football. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a terrible Polish accent. I'm not sure I was even close. I, I this is kind of Russian. <laughs> it was, it was, I'll be honest, it was my Russian accent. I was just masquerading this bullshit. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, so we got some things we want to do uh, in addition. So uh, first, I want to, very important part of the program, take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Michael F., Shiloh S., Michael P., Glenn D., and Daniel C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. 
So, uh, we, as usual, we have some headlines. And our first headline up is, this is an interesting one, uh, from the Wall Street Journal. Mil- mystery drones swarmed a U.S. military base for 17 days. The Pentagon is stumped. So, uh, Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, it got so bad. They were, they were having these, these um, uh, swarms of drones, some as long as 20 feet long and flying over 100 miles an hour. So we're not talking DJI, you know, Air, Mavic Air 3s, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, buzzing the air base to the point where they had to move F, the F-22 squadrons from the base for a period of time and they could not fly at night because they were afraid of, you know, having a crash incident. And the thing that's interesting to me is, is we do not have the technology to track these drones because they're small enough that they, that they appear to be like birds and our radar systems are designed to filter out birds because otherwise that would just pings be, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it would be, yeah, it would be pinging. Yeah. Um, and federal law prohibits, the military from shooting down drones near military bases in the U.S. unless they pose an imminent threat. Now, uh, a bit of interesting data about this is uh, this started happening not long after that big, remember the big Chinese spy balloon that floated over the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, last year? And they they were waiting to shoot it down until it got over an area where it wouldn't land on anything. And so they shot it down or off the uh, the Atlantic coast, and it was planes from Langley that shot it down. Huh. So it's possible this was some sort of retaliation, but uh, one of the things that comes out in this article is they talk about how uh, the military, this is not in, new, I mean, just the intensity of this particular incident was new, but uh, military has been seeing drones all over the place near its bases throughout the U.S., uh, spying, probably, prop, you know, is, is, is probably what's going on. They're, they're spies. Uh, so there's more to the story, but did, any initial thoughts on this, Patrick? Yeah, I, what I would say is that, uh, you know, I work at a power plant, right? And we're, a lot of times we're kind of considered restricted airspace uh, due mm-hmm. to our, you know, fundamental nature to everybody's reality anymore. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> We have seen a significant uptick in drone flying in and out of our our airspace, I guess, to, to put it, um, which is interesting to me from a couple standpoints. A lot of the drone activity is, is smaller drones. Um, they don't typically move nearly that fast. It's not like mili- necessarily military great stuff. Mm. And they usually fly in at night, um, which uh, we have a lot of large structures at power plants. And so it's interesting to me, we don't find more broken ones uh, Mm because you figure they, we we don't have a lot of places that are super well lit because we don't send people there (laughs) a lot. Right. right. Um, So they seem to have some amount of sophistication to them. And we saw a real uptick. There was a time frame a couple months ago where there was a lot of uh, random threatening letters going out to power plants across the country and we saw an uptick in drone activity around the same time and it i won't say it's completely died off but it's died down uh since then and so i the reality is it's no telling like where these things come from and who's who's controlling them you really have nothing nothing and um i'd be interesting to see if they could figure this out (laughs) well and given what's going on like in the war in ukraine and in Israel, the fact is, is over the past couple of years, drones have become a huge part of warfare. You know, we see constantly drone attacks on power plants and on military bases and on other targets like that um, of various sizes. And because drones, unlike, say, missiles, are maneuverable and they can stop short and they can be remotely piloted and all of those things. And they're relatively low cost compared to, say, planes and, and whatnot. So that's concerning, um, you know, if if they're connected to that. I did like the part of the story where it said when they, the Pentagon convened a, a task force, they included the Pentagon's UFO office or OSAP, which is uh, the uh, Jimmy Aiken and I have done an episode of Mysterious World on on this office. Um, now, UFO, contrary to the, the popular you know thought, 
does not necessarily mean aliens. It just means unidentified flying object. Flying object. It could be whatever. <laughs> um, but they usually focus on um, unidentified flying objects with unusual flight characteristics, I think is how they put it, uh, yeah. that, that do things that are not expected. So uh, one of the interesting parts of this is they actually caught a guy who was flying a drone near the Newport News shipbuilding uh, uh, place out in Newport News, Virginia, uh, where they build sub uh, submarines and aircraft carriers. And this guy is like the worst spy ever. So he <laughs> rent parked his rented Tesla near Newport News, uh, <laughs> 11 miles from the Langley base and was flying his, his drone. Um, and it got stuck in a tree <laughs> and he couldn't get it out of the tree. So he left it. And uh, when officers showed up, well, before he left, the officer showed up and asked him why he was flying in bad weather. And um, they told him he had to call the fire department for help to get it down. Instead, he went back to the air, uh, to, took a damn track to Washington, D.C., um, flew to Oakland, California the next day and was boarding a plane to a one with on a one way ticket back to China what? when he was arrested because the FBI got a hold of the drone and found out that he had been photographing Navy vessels in dry dock and including shots taken around midnight. Um, and his claim was that he's just a, a, a ship enthusiast. And so that's what it was. Yeah. As I'm a ship enthusiast, I don't go down to Naval restricted Naval bases and fly my drone overhead in the middle of the night. Yeah. yeah. Not, yeah, not, not yeah. really good. Um, he, yeah. The, the uh, he was he pled guilty to uh, let's see unlawful taking photos of classified naval insta insta installations. Uh, the judge, the magistrate judge in the case, uh, didn't believe a story that he had been on vacation, was flying drones in the middle of the night for fun. The judge said there are significant holes in his story. <laughs> <No kidding. laughs> so um, yeah. It's a weird, it's a, that's, you know, it's unknown whether that's part of the other thing, but it just was a, a, a weird story. But something, yeah. something to consider that the technology, drone technology has really altered the, the balance uh, in a lot of ways in our culture. It's not just a, a fun way to take pictures, but um, there are a lot of considerations, like you mentioned with the power plants, yeah. a lot of things to consider. Um, so our next headline comes from the San Francisco Gate uh, newspaper. and. It concerns the DNA site 23andMe. Now, this was very popular a few years ago where people would take a swab of DNA from their mouth, send it in, and 23andMe would send back a thing telling them what percentage of Ashkenazi Jew you were. It seemed like everybody had a little <laughs> bit of Ashkenazi Jew in their DNA. Uh, I never understood exactly how that worked. But. Well, that's, you know, that's just the promise to Abraham uh, coming true, right? You know, more, more well, than yes, the sands. Like grains of sand. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, 20, 23 and Me was the most popular of the DNA testing companies, and they're going through some tough times right now, financial times, um, a little bit of struggle. And one of the things that's come up is that they could potentially be purchased by a third party. And if they are purchased, it turns out that the terms of service that everybody signed to get their DNA tested gives... 23 makes your DNA that the, the results of those tests that, so the D, your genetic information, an asset that the company can sell. Mm. That's a bit of a problem. And uh. even if you're not, you're not someone who d went and took the test. If someone in your family took the test, that can still say something about your, you, I mean, the police have been using these DNA, mitochondrial DNA to connect, um, you know, people like the uh, the the Golden State Killer to his crimes because they had his DNA from the crime scene, but they didn't have his actual DNA. But they had a, re a relative and connected him. There's enough of a commonality in mitochondrial DNA that you can find relatives and that that sort of thing. So, um, this this has people concerned, civil libertarians and others. Um, and, uh, one of the things that, that is being suggested is if you have a, an account at uh, 23andMe, you should go and download your data, which you can, 
and then you can tell them to delete your data and close your account. Um, and they, they, they say that they will delete your data, mm-hmm. but federal and California state law does require them to hold on to that data for, for two to three years. So um, even though they say that they're going to delete it, it's not going to be immediately. So if they get sold, that could still be sold to someone else uh, before it's required to be deleted. So huh. it, Patrick, have you ever had your DNA tested with one of these services? No, not, not with one of those. I I've had it tested. Um, for medical Medically. reasons yeah um yeah kind of you know when my son's heart condition we we all got tested to see if we had because there's a whole bunch of ongoing studies to try and determine why uh you know certain portions of the population have these diseases and others don't right so we've done it for that kind of stuff right and um, HIPAA applies to all that yeah yes yes so i'm you know ironclad as, as about an ironclad protection you can get <laughs> for right. for data is hipaa um, this is weird though, because it's like it's like your blueprints, right? Like, yeah. Do you own your blueprints? Do you? I mean, right. it's, it's like your fingerprint. You can't right. alter your DNA. If if you get your identity stolen through the DNA, I'm not sure how that would work, but just you know. But if someone you, you can't change your DNA, you you are that's who you are, and like your fingerprint. So, yeah, huh. it's bad. It it it's kind of, you know. Oh man, I just I've got like a sci-fi thriller now where you know some guy steals the the DNA data and then prints out like fingerprints and then goes and commits a crime, <laughs> and then this other guy's being you know. <laughs> mm, that would be interesting. Yeah, it turns and out it, to go back leave, to some senator and <laughs> DNA leave DNA evidence like hairs or whatever or skin cells yep. around. Yep. Oh man, that's that. Ooh, that is a good thriller. Maybe someone should write make that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they can't copyright now that SQPN about it on the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to make it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, at this point, like, I my both my brother and my sister have done the swabs like in oh. their, like they're they and their spouse and i've like when i was looking at the story i immediately sent them the link and said you need to go d- delete your data like you like this is bad and and honestly it's like it's like contact farming you know whenever you sign up for a new service and it says upload your your contact database to see if anybody else is a member and what you're really doing is doxing everyone in your uh, address book yeah. By giving out all of their contact information to this company. Yep. You know, it's like, uh, thanks for doxing me. Um, yeah. But that's kind of what's going on with when with your relatives when you d- do one of these DNA testing things. Ugh. That's nuts. It is <laughs> crazy. I want I want some court of law to be like, no, I'm sorry, these this this stuff belongs to God. <laughs> not to any man <laughs> or at least to the people whose dna it is yeah at the very the least need to, need to it is not I, I want somebody somewhere some you know legislature or something to declare that dna is not a, a tangible asset of a company yeah you know to be sold i think that i think at, at the minimum that would be what i'd like to see so uh, all right, so our third headline comes from the Associated Press, and this concerns the recent Hurricane Helene. Uh, it says, how volunteers bring solar power to Hurricane Helene's disaster zone. And it's kind of funny. I've seen some people criticizing solar power as, oh, what are you going to do now? You know, how are you going to charge your, your your electric car now that you know there's no power in you know western North Carolina? And I'm and I, the, I kind of respond to that by by relating this story from this YouTuber who has one of those electric F one fifties, and it it can act as a generator. So it it doesn't. So it's a giant battery. So you can hook it. You can reverse the power flow out into your house, which he did. And he said he hooked up his fridge and his freezer and maybe the stove to the truck. And over the course of 48 hours, it used up 6% of the battery capacity in the truck. Huh. 
which is pretty darn impressive. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. That that if I owned a electric you know vehicle, that would be a that it it can work as a battery in outage. Well, this story is about solar, uh, and they they talk about how so many people have they've had their power out for weeks now, and they're trying to live off of these little you know diesel or gas generators which are not designed to run for weeks on end. And they have to get gas to power them, which, you know, sometimes they have to travel for hours and hours to find gasoline to, to bring back to power them. And it's not just for convenience sake. This is, you know, some of these generators are running fridges that are keeping insulin cold or powering a uh, medical uh, equipment or any, something like that. So there's this nonprofit called, um, what are they called? Uh, well, let's see. It's, 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 there's a nonprofit called the Footprint Project that's working with a uh, local solar installer companies and the local electric utilities to set up to provide free, uh, solar panels and generators, uh, and power inverters to communities. And usually they, they bring it to like the local, you know, community distribution center for aid, like uh, the local church or fire station or something like that. And they set them up there and they can, you know, power the fridges or what whatnot to keep, or the communications infrastructure to keep people connected. I think this is really awesome. And it makes me think about how um, I have solar p- panels, but I don't have a solar battery. Uh, the um, it, Ours is a uh, basically solar on demand so that during the day, it powers everything in the house, and at night, when it's not getting any, you know, solar, uh, we're running off the electric grid. Um, but during the day, excess power is basically sold back to the grid, and we get a uh, a, a uh, credit on our bill, and it builds up over the summer, so that in the winter we work off of that credit. So it, you know, hopefully it balances out. It doesn't exactly, but if we had a battery on the side of the house, the excess uh, electricity that we generate during the day could go into the battery. And that's great. But when the power's out, when the grid is down, you know, we'd be sitting pretty as long as there's sunlight and a tree hasn't fallen through our solar panels. That would be (laughs) a prerequisite. Um, Yeah. You know, we're still, we'd still have power. Um, So, uh, I, but I love the idea that they're out there helping these communities with these solar generators. Uh, Patrick, you have a unique perspective, I'm sure, on on all of that. Right. So, you know, I think something you have to keep in mind is this this kind of thing can work pretty well for a fridge or maybe a freezer or maybe both. But you're not going to power much more than that. It's definitely not going to work for climate control. So any kind of AC right. or heating these, um, these small things that they're dropping right. off as opposed yeah. to a whole house thing. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Cause uh, solar power is very much a game of uh, land usage, right? So you need, uh, I think I want to say it's 10 acres of megawatt and the megawatts a thousand kilowatts, right? So if you look at your bill and you say, Oh, I used, uh, you know, 1500 kilowatts, you use 1.5 megawatts. It would take, you know, uh, 15 acres of solar to to power that. If that and that was if it was getting sunlight that entire time, right? So uh, this stuff works really well um, in the sort of small applications. If you're if you're just wanting to run a single kind of compressor, a single couple of motors, that kind of a thing. Um, and it's really what's really awesome about it is you can drive these in, right? Because a lot of time the road infrastructure is more hardened than your electrical infrastructure and set them up and then power a house, possibly two, if you get enough space to put it up. Um, because a lot of times the local, the the lines in a community area will be underground. They'll go underground with a transformer and the high lines that supply them are not the medium lines that supply them will be down, but you could hook into there and you could potentially power a neighborhood this way. If you could get enough surface area. Yeah. Uh, Cause that's, that's always the game. Unfortunately here on the East coast, and especially in the Northeast, all of our power lines are still on poles, which is the dumbest thing ever, but. Well, (laughs) you say that um, what we found 
with burying wires, though, it makes them susceptible to problems that are, are uh, slightly more difficult to solve. Um, mm-hmm. And that is electrical currents and especially lightning strikes. Um, you can have a lightning strike a long ways away, take out a large portion of, you know, it hits in one area and it'll take out a large portion of underground because, wire in that area oh, because, because as it dissipates through is the ground. Conductive. As right. opposed to the air, which is non-conductive. Right. All the electricity is going to the ground, so the wire is kind of, unlike in the air, where they're just sort of hanging out, um, and they're susceptible to high winds and uh, well, rain-ish, but but high winds. In the yeah. ground, in, it's like... Idiot drivers. Right. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, so that's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But, and the cost is about uh, seven times. So uh, uh, putting up a pole and running a wire is one seventh the cost of trying to run the same wire underground. So those are kind of the dual reasons we haven't moved to that sort of a thing. Yeah. They may, we may figure out a way to harden it so that we can run them under wire underground more reliably. But right now the, the storm that takes out your wires that are in the air is the same storm that's going to take out the wire in the ground. Right. I see what you're saying. So as far as the capacity goes, like one of the things like on my house, our our installation is, uh, I think they said 14 something kilowatt hour, um, which would, which basically covers our usage plus a little extra. I think that's always the idea is so yeah. like we use like 11 kilowatt hours peak, um, like over the, like on a sunny summer day, we generate something like 70 in the course of in the like my best month, I've done like uh 1.5 megawatts oh, wow. um so so it's like for individual homes like with a with a full installation that could be a good thing especially if you have batteries but um but for this sort of thing right the like i'm looking at the size of the typical installations they're dropping off at these community centers they're pretty small still like they're they're a handful of panels and the the thing with solar is it has to be pointed in the right place at the right you know, the right direction without yep. shade on it, like all those things cause big drop off in efficiency. There's a reason why these big installations are out in the middle of nowhere, you know, yeah. nothing to shade them. And they uh, move so. with the sun and yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So, um, but it's, 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 it's a great thing to see that these you know people being innovative with the ways of helping these folks who are just, who have been cut off. They said that, of the one and a half million people who were without power in the beginning, they are down. There's still like 25,000 customers still without power, you know, several weeks in. So, yeah, <laughs> it well, just can't imagine. it's a factor of like those portions of those states that are seeing this don't usually see these kind of hurricanes. Right. Right. If, if this had hit the coastal part of that state, the response would have been much faster because those utilities are ready for it. Yes. Whereas the, the utilities in the back ends of the states are like, what is this? <laughs> like we've never well, had to deal with this volume of work. <laughs> and they said this, they're not doing repair. They're, they're rebuilding the infrastructure from scratch in many areas. Yeah. It's like as if it doesn't exist in the first place, including roads. <laughs> like in a lot of these places, there are no roads anymore. So yeah. uh, God bless them. All right, so those are our headlines. Let's move on to our picks of the week. Patrick, uh, what, you want you to go first? What's your pick this week? So uh, keeping in line with our, our primary topic, uh, my pick is the streaming app, uh, the SEC Plus. It is, it is a paid uh, service. And the reason I like it is because I can watch the halftime shows of my uh, college football teams. And I, I always loved watching the bands play and they don't show that on the broadcast televisions. They don't show that on ESPN or ESPN plus or whatever, but they do show it on sec plus. And I'm sure if your if your conference is the ACC or the big 10, I'm, I have a feeling it's on their, you know, streaming services as well, but that's the SEC's mind. So. <laughs> okay. Is this the, um, SEC sports.com that they do in conjunction with ESPN. Yes. Okay. I want to say so, they're, they're kind of hand in hand with ESPN at this point. Yeah. Okay. Hip, so we make sure we hip. give the people the right link there. Yep. Good. SEC plus. And uh, how much does that cost? Do you know, off the top of your head? 
Uh, oof. I want to say it was like six ninety nine when I signed it. Well, it was originally it was like a buck ninety nine, <laughs> but it's gone up in price. I want to okay. say that was it. Yeah. Okay. So my pick this week is uh, an app that uh, I think some people will find very useful. It's a it's available standalone, but it's also available um, via a set app. So if you are a set app subscriber, you need to. First, you need to drink because I said set up, but uh, then you uh, but you also get this for free with that. Um, it's called In Your Face, that In Your Face dot app, and it has one simple function, which is to take over the entire screen and tell you you're supposed to be in a meeting right now. <laughs> so it's a uh, it it makes notification alerts about uh, meetings, you know, whether it's in person meetings or. Uh, zoom or face you know or, or whatever uh but whatever's on your calendar it uses your calendar and it throws up this thing and it has it will have a link if it's a zoom you can click the link and it opens up the zoom for you and and stuff like that so it's basically if you're the type of person who just you know has a hard time seeing the small notification in the top corner of the screen or you know have a tendency to ignore the buzzing of your phone <laughs> or, or that sort of thing this will take over your screen in a way that you cannot miss and tell you, you need, you know, it's time to go to your meeting or to get, you know, to get, to get online for your meeting or whatnot. And it's customizable. There's a whole bunch of different ways to tweak it and to, uh, it has ways of, you know, things that to, to, to customize the information it tells you and it supports all the different video conferencing services. So it's, uh, it's, it, it can be really useful. I don't use it because I don't tend to have the problem of missing my meetings. Um, and um, I don't want it taken over my screen when I'm in the middle of like, say a podcast, that sort of thing. So I found like it would, it would pop up too often. Uh, and there's ways to, to, to tweak it. I could put things in separate calendars and that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, it just isn't, hasn't been a huge problem for me, but for some people it may be. So if you have set app, it's part of set app. If not, you can, uh, this is a subscription, two bucks a month or 20 bucks a year. Uh, but frankly, you know, if, if you use three apps on a set app, you, you, you're paying for it anyway. So you may as well, um, you may as well go that route. That's, that's yeah, how I, I ended up using it. I, I'm going to, I'm going to have to get this because <laughs> I literally this morning <laughs> missed a meeting because I, I forgot more or less. <laughs> right. No, and then it wasn't, in my place with the Outlook calendar screaming at me. So, yep, yep, yeah. So, yeah, excellent. Well, good. I'm glad. I hope this helps because uh, <laughs> it, it is it is a very useful tool. Yeah, because I excellent. am that kind of guy. <laughs> like, I need this to take over my screen and say, "Hey, dummy." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wonder if you can use like a customized notice like that. Hey, dummy. Yeah. What are you meeting? <laughs> Uh, all right, so that should do it for us this time. We would love to know what uh, any of you thought of anything we discussed uh, uh, in this episode. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash technology or the StarQuest Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. Send an email to technology at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. You can find the links from our discussion and our picks of the week on our show notes at starquest.fm slash TEC274. Be sure to follow The Secrets of Tech on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or TuneIn on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube, where you should also make sure to hit the bell to get notifications of new episodes. So until next time, Patrick Mason, thank you for joining me and sharing The Secrets of Technology. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. Join a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go on pilgrimage to the mysterious shrines and sites of Italy in the Jubilee year 2025 with Jimmy Aiken and me, Dom Bettinelli. Go with us on a 12-day, all-inclusive tour that gives you incredible access to Jimmy's insights in Rome, Assisi, Orvieto, Monte Cassino, San Giovanni Rotondo, the Grotto of St. Michael, 
and more. We're also planning special activities like recording on location for future episodes of Mysterious World and an in-person Weird Questions episode just for pilgrims. Space is limited and filling up, so be sure to find out more. Visit mysterious.fm slash Italy 2025 to reserve your spot today. That's mysterious.fm slash Italy 2025.